Okay. We're going to finish Hebrews chapter 7 tonight. We're just going to get through it. It's been amazing what Paul's been teaching us the last six months or so. Let's just do a little bit of a, a introduction to this because it's been a few weeks since we've been in Hebrews. This is about a new priesthood, a priesthood about love. This is the new priesthood of love. We're exploring Yahushua's original priesthood pattern and its origins. Just to pick up where we left off. Was it from Abraham, this priesthood? He was the first Hebrew, but was it from Abraham? Was it from Levi, the replacement priesthood? Or was it before Abraham? I mean, the word Hebrew or Ebrith means to cross over. Abraham had to cross over from something into something else. There's a clue there. Yahuwah also left his throne to cross over and transform into a new creation in time through, as we know, a Hebrew seed from Abraham and divine eternal blood. That's how he was born, a man yet perfect. He came into the royal earthly line of David, not a priestly line, a kingly line. So we also must follow and cross over from death to life, transforming into what? A Hebrew? Elohim kept his promise to Abraham by entering this realm through his seed. He honoured Abraham's covenant. He honoured his friend Abraham and, and kept his word and came through his seed like he promised. And David, through his seed. Why? Because of love. The way is all about love. All the times he wanted to dwell with them, from the most primitive altars to the tabernacle, the temple, all of it was just so he could be close to his people. So even the word Hebrew, the word Ibrith, points us higher. There's a clue there of changing over, transforming. This is all going to be familiar because this was supposed to be done about two weeks ago. So we've been talking about all these things ever since and it's really exciting. Elohim is love in unapproachable light. Everything in this earthly realm, Hebrew language, chosen nation, priesthood order, it's all mere shadows like breadcrumbs, puzzle pieces, or as we've been saying since, like modules. They all go through the covenants to point us to the true light of creation song, the most powerful, ecstatic, universe-forming love language. Hebrew's great, but there's a language, a behavior, an existence, a experience to have that's beyond all that. It's a love language, the most ecstatic, universe-forming love language language, love behavior, and love way that frackles up, disintegrates, surges, surrounds, dwelling in a completely foreign, higher plane of existence to us here. You can't find it on this, on this earth, only in another dimension. So if you're not connected to that other dimension, you will not find this love language, this love experience Amen. on this planet. Yeah. So... And we know how to get into the dimension, don't we? So, did you deliver us from sin and death to restore us to an earthly Hebrew path and an earthly Hebrew lifestyle? Or is our new covenant, our crossing over, our transition, our morphing into a superior heavenly order and eternal priesthood of Yahushua? Of course it is. Remember, this whole dimension will frackle and dissolve away at Yahushua's arrival, in order for the ultimate new creation crossover. Therefore, all text must be read in a supernatural context of the parable. All text is a parable. Not confining it to mere Hebrew shadow and making that the ultimate goal. And as we've seen a few times now in the last few weeks, this picture here, Yahushua wants not to restore us to a replacement priesthood he wants us to be replaced to the uh, restored sorry restored to the perfect priesthood that he had in the garden and we're going to be even closer than adam and eve were because they could see the other dimension they had open heaven so to speak but they couldn't go in could they his dimension is coming here we're going to be consummated so it's going to be even closer even closer than the perfect garden so there's a little bit of an introduction let's get into hebrews 7 because it's all about this priesthood so, Paul continues, if perfection, remember he's talking to Hebrew people who are ingrained in this priesthood, if 
Perfection came through the Levitical priesthood, where the people received the Torah laws. Why would there be a need for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, instead of just after the order of Aaron again? It makes sense, doesn't it? If that was so perfect, why does he need to come and be a new priest? In the order of Melchizedek. Why didn't he just come in the order of Aaron? But order there is the Hebrew word seder. Means rank or arrangement. (coughs) So he came in a certain rank. He had a status, didn't he? He came in the status of Melchizedek, which was him anyway. He's the Aleph Tor. He brought in a new arrangement. We are to discard the old order for the new creation order. The Melchizedek order. Not a Hebrew order, it's a supernatural order. If you want to find out something, you look up the Hebrew language. But the order is from another dimension. It's a heavenly order, a supernatural order. Paul continues, Because truly no one could be made perfect through that old system of priests. That's interesting. What's the point of it if you can't be made perfect? There's no hope for perfection. No one could be made perfect through that system of priests, so there was a need for another priest to come, one like Melchizedek, not Aaron. And that perfection, just like they were in the garden, that's the restoration. Levitical priests could never truly deliver anyone because of the very nature of the whole system. Everything in the natural must become supernatural, all promises, all covenants, all Everything, commands, everything, it comes into the royal laws. It's all got to be supernatural, doesn't it? Everything. So since the priesthood has been changed, it is absolutely necessary that the Torah law change also. Like I haven't read Hebrews for a long time and reading this with fresh eyes, knowing who Yahushua is, our Elohim, I'm reading this going, how can there be any any argument? Paul's saying there's a change. There's a new priesthood. There's a new priest. There's a new Torah law. There's a new this. There's a new that. Where's the argument? The argument is a lot of people just abandon Paul because that's how simple it is. He's too hard to understand. Let's get rid of him. We don't believe in Paul anymore. He's a heretic. You can see why they think that because it's spelled out for us. So do we want the Levitical priesthood with the Torah of Moses or do we want the Melchizedek priesthood with Yahushua's two royal laws? It's obvious, isn't it? And all the prophecies of old that say, when Yahushua comes back and remember the day of this and remember that, remember the Torah of Moses, what do we do with that verse? It's talking about the royal laws, the Torah of Moses, the spirit of the law that was there, the spirit of the Torah that's carried through, changed over into the, the new royal laws. And of course, it's Yahushua's voice daily, isn't it? That's how we remember the Torah. It's been transitioned, it's been morphed into the behavior of love. A changed priesthood shadows the bridal assembly where Yahushua is the head and we are his body. That's what the new priesthood stands for. A new priest must arise. All the shadows must pass away when the substance has come. Why would you be interested in shadows if the substance has arrived? Prophecy must vanish and transform into a reality. Guess what, everybody? My children, my wife, my husband, they're coming to visit us. They're coming in. We're looking forward to it. We've cleaned the house. We've made a feast and everything. They're coming, they're coming, they're coming, like words, prophecy. They're coming, they're coming, they're coming. And when they come, nobody cares. Isn't that what Yahushua experienced? Nobody cared. They just want to keep listening to the prophecies. He's standing right there. Aaron was a singular priest. And he needed a priesthood, didn't he? He couldn't do it by himself, that big tabernacle. And all the priests, the tribe of Levi, he needed others. So this is the priesthood model. What's the model? Needing other people, groups of people. You need to be in a group, an assembly, in other words. You need to be coming together. And look at this scripture here. Look how good and pleasant it is for brothers and sisters to come together in unity. It is like the precious anointing oil of Aaron's head that ran down his beard and onto the hems of his garments. As the dew of Hermon that comes down on the mountains of Zion, for there Yahuwah gives the blessing of eternal life. There, where? Where people come together in unity, where two or more are gathered in my name. There Yahuwah gives the blessing of eternal life. The Zion, where is it now? 
the bridal assembly of new living temples. All these little temples joined together as a royal priesthood, a nation, and that's going to be transformed into the new Jerusalem when it comes. <clears throat> we'll be all the lively stones fitted together. Got to be lively first though, don't you? This is a prophecy of old. This is a prophecy of the old order metamorphing into the new order. And we know this one really well, Jeremiah 31. Look, the days are coming, said Yahuwah, when I will make a new covenant, with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, which they broke. I'll put my Torah laws in their inward parts and write it on their hearts and will be their Elohim and they will be my people and they won't need to teach their neighbor or their brother and sister anymore saying, no, Yahuwah, please, come on, no, Yahuwah. They won't need to, for they'll all know me, from the least to the greatest of them, says Yahuwah. We can only reach this maturity in Yahusha. There's no other way to reach that maturity, to know who Yahusha really is. So, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? I'll write it on your hearts. How can you escape it when the heart's within you? It's not your physical heart that's pumping, but it's your heart, your being, your thought, your seat of your thoughts. It's where you think from. It's your whole decision-making spot of your being. How can you escape it? I mean, you can take these stupid seats, eats off and throw them away and get away with whatever you want. How can you escape it when it's written on your heart? You can't. See how important the real supernatural experience is, the love? I only say seats because that's what they had to you wear back then as a reminder. Now it's written on us. So the Levitical order was imperfect. The Levitical order was imperfect, incomplete, unsatisfactory and temporary. But the Melchizedek priesthood is perfect, complete, satisfactory and eternal, superseding the ironic and taking over where it finishes off. It was long before the ironic even before creation, because Yahushua was before creation, yet it takes over from the Aaronic. The Aaronic was just there for a time to prepare them for Yahushua. And if you're not quite sure that Yahushua fulfilled every single thing in the old scriptures, let's just briefly skim through this. There's a shadow and there's a fulfillment. The shadow was in Yisrael, a couple of thousand years of history there with Yisrael, what they went through, and Yahushua fulfilled it all. Yisrael was called out of Egypt. Yahushua was born into the world, the Egypt, so to speak, because the world is likened to Egypt. Yahushua was born into Egypt. Blood of the lamb on their doorposts, blood of Elohim. He was born with the blood of Elohim surging through him. They were immersed through the Red Sea when they came out of Egypt. Yahushua was immersed in water. Yahushua was immersed in water. There was the fiery and cloudy pillar, and Yahushua had Elohim's spirit. Because he was Elohim. He is Elohim. Egypt experienced three days and three nights of darkness. Yahushua had his own darkness three days and three nights, didn't he? Death and a resurrection after the sign of Jonah. Three days and three nights. Then they came into the wilderness and they had Elam's 12, wo- 12 wells of water. Yahushua, 12. Yahushua chose 12 disciples. Elam's 70 palm trees. Yahushua sent forth 70 people. Israel had a covenant of healing. Yahushua just healed everybody, didn't he? Ministry of healing. They came to the Mount Sinai at the Feast of Pentecost, 50 days after Passover, and the book of Acts. After Yahushua had gone back, 50 days later, he came as the tongues of fire on their heads, didn't he? The Torah laws were written on stone, stony tablets. The Torah laws are now written on the heart. Torah of sin and death. Because Moses smashed the tablets, remember? They didn't deserve to be priesthood. They didn't deserve to come up the mountain. So he, he just stuffed his. And he, he uh, wrote it down in a book. And he, he had to write it then. It was done by man. So Yahushua, of course, brought the Torah, the spirit of life. He didn't come to abolish anything. He just behaved the true spirit and life within every command. Kingdom of priests, question mark. If you, if you, if you, if you... You can be a kingdom of priests, a royal priesthood, a set-apart nation. Moses said that to them. If you, if you. But when Peter said it, after you, who should come and go on and come on, Peter said, you are a kingdom of priests. Not if you, you already are. 
So face it and behave it. Yahushua's made us a kingdom of priests. There's no if there now. They were the assembly of the firstborn in the wilderness and we're the assembly of the firstborn in Yahushua's blood. Babylonian captivity. Israel sinned, they were divorced, they idolatry, they were taken to get Babylonian captivity. And of course, after the apostles, apostles all started to die out, history went into the, the assembly went into the dark ages where the, the spark sort of went out. And then it started to restore it again, just like the temple, they, Ezra, and then went back into the land again and started restoring the temple. Supernaturally, we're all being restored, aren't we? We're coming back into the restoration of what we're meant to be in the book of Acts, the living temples. Of course, as we've been discussing, Levitical priesthood, now Melchizedek priesthood. Behaviour of death, behaviour of life. So, Yahushua proved it, didn't he, in his life. He's still proving it today. He's alive. The promise is to Abraham and his seed. All the promises given to Abraham were for his seed, not seeds, plural. In other words, they were for Yahushua to have, own, partake of, fulfill, die, resurrect, go back in, and then flood it into his people, those promises. If we are in Yahushua, we are... Ooh. If we are in Yahushua, we are heirs of these same promises as a new priesthood in a new covenant of love. All the promises they were given are fulfilled in us. So, Paul continues. So we're, of course, talking about our Messiah, Yahushua, here when he talked about the new priest rising up. Of course, we're talking about Yahushua, who sprang up from a different tribe, Judah, one that never served as priests at the altar. And Moses never said anything about priests belonging to that tribe either. Yahushua sprung up through a metamorphosis, sprung into a different tribe, like a plant springs up. He sprung forth from Mary's womb. He metamorphed. Moses never spoke of a priesthood changeover, but he did see Yahushua. In his lower form, remember when they went up the mountain? He was standing on the sapphire pavement, on the foundation that looked like sapphire. So Moses didn't have that revelation yet that there was going to be a changeover of a priesthood, but he did see Yahushua and he was obsessed with him, just like Abraham was obsessed with him. Yahushua didn't spring up from the tribe of Levi, but from the tribe of Judah as a king. So these things become so much clearer when we see that another priest has come. In the image of Melchizedek, the text says, in the likeness. Likeness and image are the same word. What about that? Paul even uses the same word. This priest has come in the image of Melchizedek. Just like Yahushua appeared in different images through history, Melchizedek being a big one of them, Yahushua has now appeared as a Melchizedek. Yeah? Yeah? Melchizedek was an image or similitude, fancy word. Melchizedek was an image or a similitude of Yahushua, a symbol, a shadow, an image. Not the other way around. Yahushua didn't come, it says Yahushua came in the order of Melchizedek, but who was Melchizedek? Yahushua. So who came first, Melchizedek or Yahushua? Yahushua came first. Now, Yahushua chose to appear as a man to Abraham so that he wouldn't get frackled up. He came in a lower form, just like he did with Moses and other people. Now he came in the flesh, after the order of Melchizedek. He manifests himself to Abraham in an image of who he would one day become in his new body. For Yahushua was made a priest but not by the Torah laws. So it's very important to understand this. Why didn't he just show up as Elohim? Here, uh, this is me. Bow down and worship me. I'm Elohim. Why didn't he just make it simple? Because he had to fulfill all these prophecies, a suffering servant, a lamb. He had to die for sin, didn't he? He had to die. He had to go there and, above all, teach us. Why was he praying to himself? Why was he doing this Why, to, as a behavior? To show us a humble behavior. That's why he did it all, to show us. Yahushua was made a priest, but not by the Torah laws of carnal, fleshly command. It says it. Being born into the right tribe, in other words. No, 
He became a priest by the power of an endless life. You can't be a priest because you weren't born from the tribe of Levi. No, he became a priest and a king by the power of an eternal life. So how ridiculous is it to return to the dead Torah, dead priesthood of sin and death, given ever since Adam sinned, ever since the first animal was sacrificed to cover Adam's sin. There was a new order going on, an order of sacrificial lambs and animals and blood. Why would you return to that after encountering Yahushua as eternal king and priest? You can see why they had to before he died, can't you? But when he died and there's new blood, why would you return to that? For this is what the scriptures say about him. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. It's written in the Psalms of David. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Forever. It's an everlasting covenant. Now, whenever you see the word everlasting, we used to always think, oh, what's everlasting? It lasts forever. It can't be broken. The seats. it says this is an everlasting institute. Got to do it forever. The feasts, the commandments, they're all everlasting. Circumcision as well. That said everlasting after it too. Everlasting command from generation to generation. How can something be everlasting if the people die and break it? How can something be everlasting? Nothing of flesh can last but must transform or perish. Sorry, only the, only the supernatural is eternal. So anything... This eternal has to be supernatural because the priest, the king, doesn't die. He's alive forever. And if we make it, we'll be alive forever too. So that's how it becomes eternal and everlasting. Only Yahushua's new supernatural way is everlasting. And he showed us the way, didn't he? It's all about love. So that's how when you read things and you go where it's everlasting, it's got to be supernatural because that's the only thing in his dimension that lasts forever. Everything in this dimension is going to frackle up. So, this verse here is very interesting. I'll show you why. The old Levite order has now ended because it was weak and worthless. A cancelling of the Torah law. That's how I've worded it. I'm going to show you a few different ways and you'll see what's going on. It won't take very long. When it talks about the Torah law, the old Torah law, the old Levitical priesthood, what Judaism, Messianics, Nazarim have done, Yisrael's Yahuwah-only doctrine, all tied up in this Torah law. I want to show you. Because there's been some tampering done with this, that sentence there. I'll show you what the very first, one of the oldest Jewish Bibles say. It's a bit small. For on the one hand, there is an abrogation of an earlier mitzvah. There is a cancelling, in other words, of an earlier mitzvah commandment because of its weakness and effectuality that's what one of the oldest jewish scriptures says there is a cancelling <coughs> a cancelling of an early command says it there now when you come to the newer more modern jewish bibles thus on one on the one hand the earlier rule doesn't say command rule is set aside because of its weakness and inefficiency so when we look at the word mitzvot and when we look at the word uh, rule, it's all talking about the Hebrew word Torah. What some people call the law, but the Hebrew word is Torah, which just means instruction, command. So the earlier Jewish Bibles says mitzvah. The newer one says a rule. The rule has been put aside. Not the Torah. The rule has been put aside. Now let me show you. That's from the Hebrew perspective. Now let's look at it from the Christian perspective. In the 1599 Geneva Bible, one of the earliest Bibles you can get, it says, for the commandment that went afore is disannulled, cancelled, because of its weakness thereof and unprofitableness. So it's pretty obvious, the commandment, gone, put aside. Now the newer King James ones say there's a, there is verily a disannulling, a cancelling of the commandment. So, so far you've got three versions that all say the commandment has been put aside. The commandment has been put aside, except the newer Jewish ones that say, the rule has been put aside. Sounds like they want us to continue in the old Torah, doesn't it? So that's three versions. Now let's come to the ISR scriptures, the 2009 one. 
there is indeed a setting aside of the former command. So they've got it right. Now let's look at the BYNV. There is in, so we've got five versions now that say, or was it four, that say setting aside the command. Now let's come to the BYNV. There is indeed a setting aside of the former order. Not the Torah, the order. That is the order of Levi. Because of its weakness and unprofitableness. In other words, the high priest died. See how this version, there's no other version that says it. Except this one here, the Jewish Bible. So in other words, it's saying the commandment has been put aside. The old commandment has been put aside. Not the old order, because that's just a given. The priesthood, old priesthood's been put away. So that's why I've worded it like this. The old Levite order has now ended because it was weak and worthless. A cancelling of the Torah law. That's how I've worded it. From all those versions there, because you want to see what the original is, don't you? I don't read Hebrew, so you want to see what the original is. Why aren't we allowed to be free from the Torah? Free to live the two royal laws of love. Sounds like some of those translations don't want us to be free of the Torah, does it? Bound to this old thing here. Why can't we be free to live the two royal laws of love? All covenants and Torahs progressively transition into Yahushua's new creation order. Got that? Moses' Torah was merely added onto Abraham's promises temporarily and only for a certain time. Even the verbal instructions given since creation were for a fallen populace without the spirit of Yahushua. Even the oral laws are passed down from generation to generation. For the Torah law of Moses could not deliver or make anything perfect, but now a better hope and expectation has been given to us. So we can draw closer to Elohim, not just once a year like the high priest could. Every day, all day, every day, we can draw closer to Yahushua. Also, it's important that Elohim made a promise with an oath when he made Yahushua high priest. For when those other men became Levite priests, there was no oath. But Messiah became a priest with Elohim's own oath, saying to him, Yahuwah has made a promise with an oath and won't go back on it. So you're a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This order will not perish. It's an everlasting order because it's, it's Yahushua. This means that Yahushua is the guarantee and surety of a better covenant from Elohim to his people. Also, when one of those older priests died, they could not continue being a priest because they're dead. And there were many of those priests. So you can see why it can't be everlasting, can it? The people kept dying. The priests kept dying. Yehusha never died. He died once and he's alive forevermore. His priesthood reigns forever. But because Yehusha lives forever, he has an unchangeable priesthood and can completely deliver, completely deliver those who come to Elohim through him. Always ready to make connection, or the original says intercession. Always ready to make connection, to present you, to pray, to connect you with Elohim when they come before Elohim. Priests connect others to Yahushua in love. That's the calling, and we're going to get back to that in a moment. The whole purpose of being called as a priesthood is to connect others, connect others to Yahushua in love. So Yahushua is the kind of high priest we truly need, isn't he? Kind, innocent, pure, set apart and without sin. And not influenced by sinners, for he is raised up high above the heavens. He is definitely not like those other priests who had to offer sacrifices every day, first for their own sins and then for the sins of the people. No, he offered only one sacrifice for all time, himself. For the Torah law chose high priests who were men and have the same weaknesses that all people have. But after that law, Elohim spoke the oath that made his son high priest. And that son is made perfect through suffering forever. 
Remember the narrative here is two people, but it's not two people. We're talking in images. Remember that when we read it, because it implies there's two people, doesn't it? You've got to understand who he is to read it. It's imagery. So Melchizedek is the real, actual person of Yahushua Messiah, given the oath of an eternal priesthood, given the title of master and invited to sit at the right hand, which means in all authority as Elohim, until all his enemies were made his footstool. When did that begin? It began when Yahushua appeared as the slain lamb, opened the seals, ushering in a war in heaven where Lucifer and his demons fell like lightning and the judgments began. That's when all enemies started to, it's not finished yet, started to be put under his feet. Because remember when Yahushua was walking around, Satan tempted him. If you do this, if you do that, I'll give you this, I'll give you that. Which means he must own it to be able to offer it to him because the world was sold over to Satan. But when Yahushua bought it back, he was booted out of the heaven, wasn't he? He now has authority and ownership and rule of the earth. So this, this puts an end of the confusion of who Melchizedek was. A few weeks ago we talked about, was he an angel? Was he a, a man? Was he Shem? Was he... If Melchizedek were anybody else, then Yahushua could never assume this Elohimly position on heaven's throne. He couldn't come in the order of Melchizedek if it was a man, if it was an angel, if it was someone superior to, in status to him, could he? It had to be him. That Elohimly position on heaven's throne, which is now portaled within the veil on the ark on the throne of our hearts, where we can have boldness to enter and connect with him also in the power of an endless life, because his life is endless. So let's finish. The new priesthood and covenant is formed in Yahushua's blood, and all immersed into him are now the seed of Abraham. This is the highest calling that we can have, the highest privilege, having Yahushua manifesting his love through us as his many-membered body. There's no higher calling to have Yahushua coming through us in that way. Everyone who experienced Yahushua Elohim were forever changed and obsessed with him. All the people throughout the scriptures that met him, experienced him, they were single-sided and obsessed with him forever, looking for him, searching for him, piling rocks together in the desperate hope that he might appear there, wanting him constantly, looking to his reign. Nothing in this world mattered anymore. They were obsessed with him. Priesthood is for others. This is the point of tonight. We're a new priesthood of love. So the priesthood is not for us. It's for other people. Not for the self. So to qualify, to qualify for this priesthood, there must be an end of self. There must be an end of self-serving. Because the priesthood was to connect people with Yahushua, weren't they? At the tabernacle, the temple. Yahushua connected us to Elohim, didn't he? Because it's him. He connected the dimensions again. This new priesthood that we are is to connect people. There must be an end of self-serving. To think of others above the self and the self-pleasing is the way. A willingness to bear and suffer and endure it all as Yahushua, al Melchizedek, and Elohim did. That's the calling for us. That's what we've been discussing in our many videos and discussions the last few weeks, isn't it? Putting off the self. Focusing on somebody else for a change. Coming into the royal laws, which are loving Elohim, Yahushua, and loving others. To have that bubbling up inside us. This is the true priesthood of love. So Paul's really just shown us what the new priesthood is all for, hasn't he? It's following Yahushua. Pick up your stake and follow me. Greater love has no man than this, that you lay down your life for your friends. It may not have to be your physical life yet, but everything else, yourself, your flesh, lay it down to serve other people. That's this priesthood. That's the calling. That's the direction of this assembly, this fellowship, isn't it? It's been confirmed by many words now. It's a priesthood of love. And it didn't come from this dimension. That's the priesthood that's going on 
I mean, that was just an image too, but John saw it in the throne room. That's what's going on. That priesthood up there. And through many types and shadows and modules, he tried to show mankind little glimpses of what's going on up in heaven. Blueprints. And then he came and showed us fully. So that's the message tonight, guys. The new priesthood. So keep that in your mind. That's what we're here for. That's why we have to overcome so we can serve other people. Yeah? If we don't get this together, why would you, who should trust us to send anybody in the door? Yeah? Understand? So, thank you, Yahushua, that you're leading and guiding us. We ask that you surround all our friends and families that have been given your word, given this message, those who are choosing to fight it currently. We pray that you continue to reveal yourself to them, give them the consequences, good and bad, and bring them into your reign more and more. We pray that you continue to strengthen us this week. And make this word alive in us that we keep your royal laws at the front of our minds and become the priesthood that you died for to bring us into. We love you, Yahusha. Close this meeting tonight in your wonderful name. So be it. Have a great week, everybody. We love you.